Okay, good morning everybody. Um, we've got a, a great turnout so far. We've still got a few people um, joining, so I'll continue to admit those. Um, and I'll get on with the, um, the introductions. So, um, welcome friends and colleagues um, to this um, online event. Thank you very much for, for joining us today. We're, um, we're quite excited to be doing this um, by the means of all this new technology. So great to see everybody's faces and thanks for joining. We're going to record the session for anybody that isn't able to join us today. So hopefully that's okay with everyone. So today's session is going to be a talk by Andy Bell for about 10 minutes on the, uh, the main key points of our new briefing paper. And then we'll um, open up the floor for lots of questions for about half an hour. So if you want to send your questions to me uh, through the chat feature, um, feel free to. And then at the end, we'll ask. Um, we're going to try and make this as interactive as possible. So we've got some polls and some quizzes as well. And also, we'd love for you to tweet during this event. So if you want to, um, I'll send out our tweet and hashtag in the message feature now so you should all be getting a a message there in the group chat and that's where you just pop in your questions as well so use those hashtags um, after the questions and answers i'll hand over to my colleague thea and she'll close the session um, if everybody can have their microphones on mute that'd be really handy but i think that everybody has so that's grand so um, I'd like to hand over now to Andy Bell, our Deputy Chief Executive, and he'll talk through the key points of the briefing paper. Over to you, Andy. Thank you, Zach. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. It's good to see some familiar faces and some new faces and new names on, on this. So, so thanks, everyone, for giving an hour of your morning to this. And, and I hope it turns out to be a useful session. Uh, if nothing else, it will hopefully be of interest. Uh, we're starting off with a really difficult question, which, which is, where, where are you joining us from today? So, so it's a really tough one, this one. It's multiple choice, so hopefully that makes it easier for you. So, so Zach, if we can put the poll up. Uh, there you go, nice and easy. Where are you joining us from today? Uh, send us your answers, and that way we'll just have a little bit of a sense of where everyone has come from. Um, and I guess we just wait a few moments for anyone who hasn't had a chance. Don't worry, there are some tougher questions coming. It's not going to be this easy all the way through. So, so uh, don't think you're going to get away with it entirely. Uh, have we got the results, Zach? We do. I can. The, now the results, these are anonymous, so I'll share those now. So here we go. Well, that's fairly clear. There we go. So there we go, we've gauged the audience and, and uh, you can't say it wasn't interactive, can you? So um, don't worry, there's more to come. Now, we uh, published a briefing paper just at the end of last week uh, that was uh, looking at mental health inequalities relating to uh, COVID-19, the pandemic. Uh, this piece of work came out of some, some uh, joint work we're doing with a group of uh, charities, uh, 17 organisations that have come together nationally uh, across the sector to, to work collectively, um, first of all, to share ideas and intelligence around what's happening uh, with the pandemic at, at such a time of crisis when we felt it was important that, that we shared knowledge and information with one another, but also to identify issues we could work on together and that we could take action on to make sure that where there is a need to act quickly in particular and relay messages to government or the NHS or local authorities, that we were able to do that as a collective, uh, a shared voice as it were. One of those key areas was to look at mental health inequalities and uh, so our Chief Executive Sarah Hughes uh, chaired a task group uh, which, which had representatives from a number of different charities on it. First of all to look at where there are short-term issues uh, that we wanted to uh, identify together uh, and secondly to look at the long-term impacts on mental health inequalities. Uh, and, and what we could and should be saying uh, over the longer term about what would make a difference to people and what some of the issues were and what some of the solutions might be. So as part of that group, we thought it was important to bring together some of the knowledge and intelligence through a briefing paper. 
Uh, we did that through two pieces of work, one of which was to review literature that's been around. Uh, and of course, a lot of that has happened quite quickly. An enormous amount has been written about a large number of issues uh, in, in a very short period of time. But we also saw expert views from people uh, working in charities, experts by experience, and people working in uh, local areas up and down the country. Uh, and indeed, members of our Commission for Equality in Mental Health which is an ongoing piece of work at the Centre for Mental Health, reviewing mental health inequalities. Uh, and my clever colleague, Louis Allwood, brought that all together into the briefing paper that I hope you've read. If you haven't, there's still time. It's still on our website, and I'm sure we'll put on the chat uh, a link to that briefing paper so you can have a good look at it afterwards. Uh, and this is just to go through some of the key points from it. So what do we know at the moment? Well, what we know, first of all, and I think it's becoming more and more clear, is that the COVID-19, the pandemic, call it what you will, is having a huge effect on our mental health and it's having effects on people's mental health across society. Uh, this is something which is a fairly common experience, uh, but I think it's also becoming clearer and clearer that this isn't a situation we're all in together or we're not all in it in the same way. Uh, and, and that there are some, some very significant risks to mental health that are being experienced by some groups of people more than others, uh, and very often it's groups of people whose mental health is most challenged in, in what we may remember as normal times, uh, whose mental health is being challenged specifically now. Um, there are some differences, of course, but nonetheless, we know from work that, that, that we and others have been doing for a long, long time that the social and economic determinants of our mental health already had entrenched inequalities in the first place. This is a new experience. Uh, we know that the children from the most deprived households are four times more likely to experience a mental health difficulty by the time they leave primary school uh, than those from the wealthiest families. We know that people from LGBT plus communities, uh, people from, from black and minority ethnic communities, uh, people with learning disabilities, people with long term health conditions already have substantially increased risks of poor mental health and very often it's those same communities that are experiencing things more, 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 more badly now. But we also know that there are, are many, many people already living with mental health difficulties who are experiencing particular challenges relating to the current uh, pandemic and, and the lockdown and all the restrictions on our lives and the changes to services. So again, we wanted to make sure we collected information as we can about that and, and broadened our understanding of what's going on for people already li living with poor mental health. So in terms of what we found, uh, some short-term issues and some long-term issues. And this is not an exhaustive list, but this is just to give you an idea of the kind of things we looked at. And I'm sure lots of people on this call will have an enormous amount of expertise that you can share with us to pick up other issues that, that we may have missed or, or not yet covered in detail. So in terms of short-term issues, there is clearly some concern about access to services. Uh, we know that it's been difficult all round that mental health services have had to make very, very quick changes. Uh, and, and many have done an extraordinary job uh, of suddenly having to adapt their offer overnight to deal with, with the arrival of the pandemic and particularly the lockdown. Uh, but of course, we know that for some, issue, some groups of people, there are particular challenges in accessing services. Uh, the most obvious is those who are excluded from the digital world. Uh, and that could be young people who may have not the right equipment or, or don't have data on their phones, people that don't have private spaces where they can access support online, particularly LGBT plus young people, for example, who may be at home and struggling to have space. Um, and indeed people whose access to mental health support wasn't great anyway. Uh, and, and you may have seen the, the report in The Guardian uh, suggesting that young black, Asian and minority ethnic people uh, are, are having a particular rise in, in, um, in this case, it, it was uh, seeking help from, from Couth, uh, the online support uh, system, but again, a very particular rise in, in help seeking from that group. And surveys are consistently showing that young people of all age groups seem to be having the biggest effects on their mental health of what's going on at the moment. We also know that there's a short term issue for people living with mental health difficulties about access to basic needs. So it's not just mental health services, it's about the other services that matter to you. Uh, and, and, and I think surveys from Mind and Rethink 
uh, have particularly uh, emphasized that people are struggling with their physical health, that access to basic necessities such as food and medicines is a real challenge. Uh, many, many people will have financial, but also psychological and practical difficulties going out to get food from the shops, going out to get medications, uh, having physical health checks or not having physical health checks. But we also know there are a number of other areas that we're concerned about. So people who are being shielded, uh, that sense of not knowing what your future is going to look like, of, of feeling particularly endangered. Uh, again, most people who are shielding will have significant mental health challenges anyway from, from living with, with serious long-term conditions. And of course, we know there is a particular challenge for people who are being uh, exposed to higher levels of violence and abuse as a result of the lockdown. Uh, and thankfully, this is something which has been talked about a great deal. But of course, it has a very significant effect on, on mental health, as well as the physical dangers that people are facing right now. So there's some of the short term issues that we've identified. Many of those have long term effects, of course. But we also know we need to be looking at the longer term and particularly thinking about what recovery looks like. So, again, some of the issues that we've looked at here, not exhaustive, but we know that, that as mental health services have changed, we've seen some really positive things happen. We've seen crisis services, helplines now being available 24 seven in every part of England, at least. Uh, that's an extraordinary change that was supposed to take three years. Uh, and some local areas have now established uh, separate crisis A&E services, for example, for people with mental health difficulties. Uh, and many, many services have moved online. For some people, that'd be hugely beneficial. But for other people, those changes might have drawbacks. And again, particularly those who are, are excluded or don't find those, those services helpful. So what do we do about bringing things back? Do, what, what changes do we keep that might help to reduce inequalities in mental health? And what changes do we need to, to go back and, and restore face-to-face -face work, for example, and how do we do that safely? I think there's a very clear issue that, that uh, as, as we move away from, from uh, the more uh, crisis uh, phase uh, and, and work towards recovery, the impact of, of what happens with the economy is going to be crucial. We know that, that people with poor mental health are more likely to be living in poverty, uh, and financial insecurity. And we know people who are facing financial insecurity and unemployment now are gonna have a much bigger risk to their mental health longer term. So what can we do to make sure that, that first of all, we minimize the chances of the recession being a really serious one? And secondly, how do we mitigate those impacts on people's mental health and on the lives of people with mental illness? So what changes do we need to make there? One of the crucial issues that's come out, and, and it's one that, that uh, is so important to mental health, is, is racism and racial discrimination. Again, that, that's been a major issue over the last couple of weeks in particular. Uh, and again, it's, it was already clear before the, the death of George Floyd and the events that followed that, um, that racism is a huge issue for mental health. It's a massive risk factor for poor mental health being discriminated against, whether that's uh, an, an individual personal experience of, of harassment, uh, or whether it's that broader systemic racism and inequality that we've seen, these have already put pressure on people's mental health. Uh, and the current crisis, if anything, is, is escalating that and, and, and creating extra trauma for people from Black, Asian and minority ethnic communities. That's been talked about a great deal, which of course is, is a sign that we're beginning to make some progress but we now have to take clear and concerted action on that and really understand that feeling of abandonment, of being let down, of being ignored and what that's meant for people. Um, and then inevitably we have to look at, at uh, trauma. We've published a separate briefing on trauma and what that, that means around coronavirus. So one of the crucial issues here, again, we know that because the determinants of our mental health are deeply unequal, people who've experienced traumatic events prior to this may find that the current traumas are worse for them than, than, than people who haven't. Uh, and again, we have to be really mindful that, that, that uh, trauma is, is an intensely personal experience. But many, many people will be, for example, returning to work, returning to school, um, going back to, to whatever normal life looks like, uh, with significant additional vulnerabilities as a result of this crisis. And what does readiness look like? And then finally, an important area that, that we talked about in the briefing is the use of the emergency powers. 
so the changes to the CARE Act, for example, uh, which, which certainly some people have been very concerned about what that means for people with mental health difficulties seeking support from, from social services. Uh, but I think also the potential changes to the Mental Health Act. And one good thing is that although the Mental Health Act changes in the coronavirus uh, legislation allowed for, for reduced safeguards, so far those haven't been used. And we very much hope they never get used. But nonetheless, they'll be on the statute book for nearly two years. So we really need to, to, to uh, hope that those never do get used. But if they do, that they're used in the very most minimal way possible. So thinking about what we were recommending, and again, this is not an exhaustive list, but these are some of the things that we feel it's important to talk about now. In the immediate term, we do need to think about how we maintain that financial safety net. Uh, the, the, the fact that we have been able to uh, bring a significant change to rough sleeping and homelessness. The fact that the benefit system has, has eased down on people and taken away some of the awful use of sanctions and assessments that have caused such damage to people's mental health. So we need to look at how we can hold on to some of those safety nets to, to reduce the risk of economic harm from the harm that's already happened. We need to think particularly about how organisations that are based in communities that are often supporting those who, who have the worst uh, side of mental health inequalities, how we support those. We know not lots and lots of voluntary and community organisations uh, are, are really struggling now financially. Many have had to respond to, to the crisis and just put resources that they often don't have in, into meeting people's needs in creative and new ways. We must make sure that they are recompensed. So far, the funding going out to the voluntary sector in mental health has nowhere near compensated for the loss of income that many, many organisations have experienced and particularly smaller user-led and community or based organisations are having the worst time of it. We do have to look at how quickly we can resume the long term plan for mental health. There were big, big plans, two billion pounds of extra funding over five years. It's really important that we don't lose sight of that and that the NHS, uh, as quickly as possible, goes back to, 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 to carrying on that programme of investment. Um, and we need to make sure that people are supported with the basics. Again, we know the NHS volunteer responder scheme stepped up to say that it would support people with mental health difficulties if they asked for help for deliveries of food and medicines. That was a really positive change that we really welcomed. And it's really important that that remains for as long as possible. Uh, and people don't get left out uh, as, as we hit to the recovery phase, but for people with mental health difficulties, getting out may still be more challenging. Um, and then thinking about longer term, there's a real opportunity here for our understanding of trauma to change. And, and for trauma-informed responses to, to how children go back to schools, how universities get back up and running and colleges, how workplaces support people to, to, to carry on working or to go back to work when, as people do. Uh, many of people, of course, haven't stopped going into work and haven't stopped going into school, but many are experiencing significant traumas. And trauma-informed approaches do no harm, but they do an enormous amount of good. So how can we really embed trauma-informed approaches in all those places people are at and going back to? Putting mental health into all policies could make a massive difference. For example, thinking about how, how schools are working, how the benefits system's working, how the criminal justice system's working. We've been calling for many years for a mental health in all policies approach. This would be a really good time to do it, and both at national government, but also locally as well. Think about what local councils can do, and many are doing, by putting mental health in all of their policies and all of the decisions they make about how we restore some kind of normality and help with the recovery process. Then we need to look at how we can embed race equality measures. There's been a lot talked about this and very little done, uh, but the Mental Health Act review in particular, first of all, suggested some important changes to legislation, which we hope will still happen as quickly as possible. Uh, and created a patient and carer race equality framework, which is currently being piloted. And again, we really need to support that and make sure that that really does happen. And we have to look at all the actions we can take now to begin to really shift the dial uh, on, on, on race inequality and mental health and not just go back to where we were before and not miss this important turning point in history, potentially, uh, to make mental health race equality something which is real rather than just something that always feels it's a little bit too far away. 
And I think in doing that, a lot of the solutions will be localized. So how can we locally encourage the NHS, local authorities, voluntary and community organizations to come together and to work with communities and work with people who are experiencing this themselves to find joint solutions and shared solutions to how we can really begin to, to create an offer that is relevant and useful to people who are on the worst end of mental health inequalities. And then finally, there are some positive opportunities to really learn from, from some of the changes that have happened uh, briefly. I talked about it earlier about the fact that, that we were able to, to make a significant change around street homelessness. We were able to see the benefits system very quickly. It's not perfect, but some of the changes have been things that, that for a long time we felt unnecessary. For example, getting rid of the sanctioning regime. So how can we hold on to some of those positives and see that actually this could last longer than the current crisis? This could be what a modern compassionate system looks like for supporting people's mental health and well-being and safety in the longer term. So there's some of the things we talked about. Uh, I think it's time I shut up and, and gave other people an opportunity to, to say something and ask something. But first we've got another poll. Um, and so Zach, would you mind sharing the poll with us? Um, and this is just to get your opinions. It's a bit more interesting than the last one, you'll be pleased to know. Um, have we got it on the screen? There we go. So what do you think? Has so your experience so far been that mental health inequalities have got worse, stayed about the same, or actually things have got a bit better in terms of mental health inequalities during the last three months? Uh, let us know what you think. Uh, I'd better do it as well, hadn't I? So how's that? Have we got results? This is gonna be legally binding, by the way. Uh, so, so, right, everyone had a go? Let's have a look. Well, this is like a Soviet election, isn't it? Um, the last question, which we'll do at the end of the Q&A, will hopefully be a bit more divisive, but, but uh, I think you've sent us a fairly clear message there. So, so that suggests that this is important uh, and you're all, I mean, possibly why you're here, of course, if you think it got better, you probably wouldn't have joined this webinar. So maybe this is a selective sample. Um, okay, in that case, I think I'm gonna hand back to Zach to, to find out what questions and comments uh, people have got. Lovely, thank you. Okay, so we have had a couple of questions come in. Um, so the first question is from Rachel Piper, and she's asked, um, Andy, can you speak about the specific challenges for disabled people? For example, care being cut? Thanks, Rachel, and, and uh, thanks for joining us. Good to see you. Um, yeah, I mean, I think this is, again, we know that the uh, disabled people have significant challenges to mental health anyway you've got you've got probably double the rate of, of uh, mental health difficulties uh, compared to the general population in normal times uh, and I think one of the things that we've seen is some real challenges uh, we're part of a group of charities uh, a, a different group of charities working together on access to food and supermarkets during this time and I think there's a large number of, of charities representing disabled people uh, including those with hidden disabilities such as autism and learning disability who are really struggling just to get access to the basics right now uh, and, and again this is one of those issues of a kind of hierarchy of needs isn't it that, that, that uh, in times of crisis it's the real basic needs in life which, which are the priority uh, and I think that's, that's certainly something we've experienced and of course that will have an impact on psychological well-being but also psychological well-being has an impact on those things so it's much harder uh, to go out to the shops if you don't feel safe there. And that's as much about feeling psychologically safe as physically. Uh, and if you're worried that, that uh, for example, the rules around face coverings, uh, if, you, if you have asthma, for example, wearing a face covering is, is quite difficult and you don't have to, but will other people know when they see you out not wearing a face covering that the reason you haven't is because actually you can't. Um, so I think that that need for understanding is, is in a sense, really important right now. And that need for adaptations uh, is really important. And of course, that, that goes way beyond mental health. But I think we do realise and, and we have to realise the impacts on psychological well-being over a longer period. 
uh, of being disabled during this time and, and the extra um, barriers that's created. Thank you. Okay, so we've had a couple of questions around the Mental Health Act as well. Um, and we've had a question from Richard Warren, and he's asked, what steps have we taken around ensuring the reform to the Mental Health Act will be followed through as soon as possible? Thanks, Richard. Great question. And, and uh, I mean, this is something that, that I think all, all, all mental health charities have been campaigning on. And of course, we've been campaigning on prior to the Mental Health Act review happening. Uh, and, and a lot of us were calling, I think, uh, uh, prior to the 2017 election, uh, when, when uh, it slightly surprised us that it was in the Conservative manifesto that they would review the Mental Health Act. In fact, they talked about tearing up the Mental Health Act. Um, so we were really pleased that there was that commitment. It, it was much sooner than we expected. Uh, and and uh, Simon Wesley's review was very comprehensive. Uh, we, we, among others, supported that. So, so uh, uh, perhaps inevitably, we, we strongly felt that when it came out, that that created an agenda that, that actually we would like to see um, enacted completely. And of course, there's a number of different parts to this, isn't there? Uh, Part of the review is about changes to the law, and that's the bit that is the most obvious part. If you want to change the Mental Health Act, you need new legislation. So, so we, among others, have been consistently calling for uh, the government to introduce its white paper. Uh, there are, there are, there certainly, it certainly was pledged, uh, and indeed in the 2019 government manifesto, uh, there was a pledge that they would continue that process of reforming the Mental Health Act. So, so we're all of us holding them to it. And I would encourage people, uh, if you want to write to your MP, to ask them to support uh, changes to the Mental Health Act, to modernise it, to bring it into line with the 21st century. The current Mental Health Act in many ways is outdated, clapped out and, and completely at odds with the, with the values that I think a lot of people now, now, now bring to mental health services. Yeah. Um, but there are other parts to it too. So the review also called for, for updating of some of the, the most um, inappropriate uh, physical environments that people are in at the moment in mental health wards. So again, there's a real squeeze on, on funding for buildings uh, within the NHS, but we must make sure that mental health uh, services get their fair share of investment. Uh, there will be a government spending review to come soon. Uh, while, while spending for day-to-day -day NHS funding has already been decided for the next five years, capital funding for buildings and vehicles and other things hasn't been decided yet. And we know that we need investment in, in the bits of the system which, for example, are still using dormitory wards. That's completely unacceptable. Yeah. Uh, and, and indeed, a lot of the environments in inpatient wards are unfriendly uh, and, and don't protect people with dignity. But we also need to build the workforce. We need more advocates out there. We need to see, as I say, progress on the patient and carer race equality framework that hopefully will, 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 will really change the way that, that, that services work uh, with regards to racial injustice. Um, and, and we need to see more investment in, in particularly mental health social work. Uh, and, and AMHPs, Approved Mental Health Practitioners, and their crucial role in the Mental Health Act. And these are things that we can be getting on with now. We don't have to wait to update the buildings. We don't have to wait to build the workforce for the law to change. We just need to see investment in those things. So keep on pushing. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we have another question from Kathleen Ward. And this is around uh, domestic violence, um, particularly leading to murder and suicide or acute trauma. And Kathleen asks, how do we look at opportunities to influence the system to address this? Yeah, I mean, this, this is a huge issue, isn't it? And, and of course, um, there, there are direct and indirect effects on mental health from, from, from domestic violence. The direct effects are, are very significant, particularly in, in tragic cases of suicide, of course, but also the longer term traumas uh, for, for, for people who are abused and people who witness abuse. Uh, and, and in many ways, witnessing abuse is being abused. So, so I think it's, it's really important. Again, we bring a mental health understanding to that. We, all, all we can do as a mental health charity is remind people that these things are both significant to people's safety now, but they affect someone's safety 
over a lifetime and, and we do know that that uh, people who've been been uh, victims of abuse uh, carry that that trauma with them for the rest of their lives it's not something that goes away and and a very large proportion particularly of women in the mental health uh, system uh, have have histories of trauma and abuse we know uh, rates in the prison system of, of having been uh, abused at some point in your life are, are incredibly high um, and in a sense all we can do is really point that out but also I think we have to note that there is a bill currently going through Parliament uh, on, on abuse and, and there are some changes to that that our friends at Agenda, uh, the, the, the charity that works specifically around women's mental health have called for a routine inquiry to become a statutory uh, requirement for particularly mental health services um, so that we are ensuring that, that where people are coming forward to ask for help for their mental health uh, there is a proper and, and sensitive and appropriate uh, way of, of identifying whether that's an issue that they face and of course it's still really important that all services whether they're mental health services or anything else are trauma informed and particularly, again, thinking about children who are returning to school, uh, many will have either been, been abused themselves or, 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 or experienced it indirectly. Uh, and so creating a safe space within schools, thinking about what that means for your behaviour management policies, for example. Uh, a child who's been abused at home goes to school, misbehaves as a result of that, and then is placed in isolation. Uh, that will create significant short and long term risks to them. Uh, and this is where having mental health in all policies is so important in all decisions, because we really do need to think about what, what that looks like. Thank you. OK, I have a question from Monica Sharma. And Monica asks, has the mental health and the race equalities framework requirements been fed back to the NHS? She says... Uh, I'm not certain if this is being worked on. I am a member of the NHSE IBM network and I'm working on the staff welfare cell. Brilliant. Thanks, Monica. I mean, the, the, this is um, at the moment the, the patient and care race equality framework that came out of the Mental Health Act review uh, is being piloted in, in two places in South London and Birmingham. Uh, so it's a very early stages. Uh, uh, nonetheless, that, that, that doesn't mean everyone else is off the hook and, and, and it's worth waiting because clearly it isn't. We do need to see action straight away. Uh, and, and I think one of the things that the current kind of combination of crises has, has brought about is a greater sense of purpose and that we can't sit around and wait forever uh, for equality. Uh, and indeed saying nothing is, is really kind of uh, just, just letting things go. So, so uh, I, I think we really do need to, to see some movement now and, and um, uh, the more we can do, the better. Um, and and uh, I think, I think, did you want to come in? Yeah, I just wanted to know, sorry to interrupt you. When you say South London and Birmingham, is that within NHS EI organisations or some other organisations within uh, London and Birmingham? As I understand it, that's within the Mental Health Trust working in those two areas. Uh, but of course, it does have to go across the whole system in those places, and it's really important that it does because we can't uh, we can't address race equality and mental health only by working within NHS trusts. It has to kind of go across the whole system. We've been doing some some work in in Birmingham, uh, evaluating some really exciting uh, projects, working with with uh, uh, young African and Caribbean men, for example. Uh, and what's come out of those is a real strong sense that obviously the NHS is part of the solution but so are schools so are the police so is public health uh, and this has to go across all aspects of life because the the things that are creating uh the the, the unfair burden of poor mental health uh in in particularly black communities are, are coming from from the multiple uh aggressions and and negative experiences that people are having and the discrimination and and um uh, again, we're, we're not going to deal with this if we only deal with it within the health system, but the health system has a responsibility uh, both to its staff and, and to the people who are coming in, indeed the people who are not coming in for mental health support. Um, and so it does have to be done on all these multiple layers. We, we can't just leave this to chance anymore. 
Thank you. Thank you. We have a, a question from Michelle Addison. And Michelle says, um, thanks for your interesting talk. Thank you very much. Glad you're enjoying it. Uh, Michelle says, I am concerned about individuals who use drugs and alcohol. Can you comment on the impact of COVID-19 and the mental health of these particular individuals? What steps are being taken to support these service users? I, I, I worry about this as well, and I don't think we have enough evidence. The one thing we know is that alcohol sales have gone up. Uh, and of course, more people are consuming alcohol at home for very obvious reasons. Um, I think what we also know longer term is, is that support for people whose, whose uh, mental health is, is related to, to the use of alcohol or drugs or, or who have co-occurring conditions has been dreadful. I, it, it's 15 or so years since a policy document came out of the Department of Health, as it then was, uh, to, to, to make it absolutely clear that so-called dual diagnosis was the responsibility of the NHS and people with co-occurring uh, mental health and either alcohol or drug needs required integrated care and support. And we're still in a position 15 years later where we hear far too often that people are still bounced from one service to another. Uh, they're told by mental health services that they can't be helped until their drinking is sorted out or their drug use. And drug or alcohol services are still saying, well, well, you've got a mental health problem. We can't really help you with that. Uh, and, and that is completely unacceptable. The current crisis will not be making that any better. Um, but again, if there's an opportunity to reset things here, one of the things we really have to look at is, is, is how we can make that work. Uh, it hasn't worked before. It, it, it's an unresolved problem. Uh, and, and I think we urgently need to find uh, uh, some kind of solution through it. What I'd be really interested in is examples of good or even vaguely positive practice uh, around support for people with co-occurring, uh, particularly alcohol and mental health needs that tend to be overlooked on, on both sides of the system um, so that we can begin to identify some, some sustainable solutions here. Uh, it's been left to fester for far too long. Thank you. Okay, so we have another question from Sarwat Tasneem. And the question is, as a woman of colour who works in the field, who are you engaging with the BAME communities in highlighting the inequalities? I'm working with various organisations in bridging the gap of awareness, but getting the attention of key mental health organisations is difficult. Yeah, thank you for that. And, and, and this is really important because I think as, as national organisations, and it's worth saying Centre for Mental Health, you know, there, there's literally 20 of us who normally work in an office. Obviously, at the moment, we don't. We, we all hang out at home. Um, but it's really important for us that we get our intelligence and knowledge from, from, from particularly community based organisations and, and those who are, are living this every day and experts by experience. Uh, that this really matters to and and so we're not just coming up with ideas in an ivory tower somewhere all of our intelligence comes from either research projects we do or, or through through linking and liaising with, with people working uh, in, in uh, very very testing situations and and people whose experiences have sometimes been been really quite terrible um, so we're very fortunate that, that we've been able to work with a number of community-based organisations and those working within communities uh, in London, in Birmingham, uh, and, and indeed in, in multiple parts of the country. Also, the Commission for Equality I spoke about, we had an open call for evidence and got some fantastic um, both first person and, and, and other bits of intelligence from community-based organisations. Uh, and and uh, do have a look at a blog that, that uh, my colleague Louis Allwood wrote based on some um, consultation events in Greater Manchester prior to all of this, which, which really tried to understand the value that they bring to people's lives and, and some of the intelligence we got from them. There's always more to learn. We always want to find out more. Uh, and, and so it's really important. I think we have that, that understanding. And if there are things that you'd like to share with us after this, We'd really like to hear from you if you've got bits of evidence that we can use for the Commission for Equality. Uh, if, if you would like to write a blog for us, we do have guest blogs on our website. Um, so there's still much more to learn. But I think one of the things that became really obvious in supporting the Mental Health Act review is we have very, very little 
in the way of research which, which has focused on the needs of, of, of a whole range of communities of the mental health system and particularly use of the Mental Health Act. Most of the evidence relates to the appalling inequalities we see for African and Caribbean communities, but most other communities' uh, experiences have been silenced. And I think we have to begin to shift that and we want to learn much more about a wider range of people's experiences of the system. Uh, we need to, to create a platform for that, but we also need to identify solutions with those, those community organisations. There's lots, lots more to do. Um, th this is by no means an issue which is sorted, but of course that's not an excuse for inaction. We don't have to wait for research to know about these inequalities and, and how they're manifesting and, and, and changing uh, people's lives in ways they shouldn't. Thank you. Um, I have another question um, from Kayan, and the question is, do you think measures taken to improve mental health overall are necessarily compatible with reducing inequalities in mental health? For example, if a certain interventions are shown to improve mental health for only those who are already better off, this will improve overall mental health, but also increase inequality. And what are your views on such measures? Yeah, thank you for that question. It's an excellent question. And it's something we've looked at through the Commission for Equality. And I think uh, one of the things that we see is this phenomenon called lifestyle drift, which is something that happens in many areas of public health. And, and what you see is, is that uh, people recognize that, that, that the causes of poor health uh, across the board are often structural. They're about poverty, they're about discrimination, they're about racism, they're, they're about abuse and violence. Um, but when it comes down to, to the action that's taken, it's often on the kind of individual level. Don't smoke, eat better food, get some more exercise, just talk. Um, and these very individualized kind of ideas. And then, of course, you have uh, traditionally a kind of information campaign where you go out and you, you put healthy messages on billboards and TV adverts. Um, and, and I think this is something which does cause us concern. Uh, clearly those, those, those broader messages don't do any harm, they generally do good, they generally improve the health of the whole population, but we know they do increase inequalities. And a perfect example of that, of course, is smoking, where over the course of the last 10, 15, probably longer, we've seen sustained reductions in the proportion of people in the population who smoke, but people with uh, particularly long-term mental health problems have been completely left behind. Uh, and the advertising campaigns haven't had any effect whatsoever. Uh, and that, of course, is because you have to understand the, the, the psychological needs that people have to smoke and, and the many, many complex reasons that mean that we've got very, very high levels of smoking among people with a mental illness. Um, but again, it, it, we've really got to kind of take this on. We've got to shift what public health does. We've got to really see inequalities as being fundamental to it. Um, you don't just, I think one of the things we've observed is, is that there is a tendency to think, well, let's do something for everyone and then we'll deal with inequalities afterwards. And that doesn't work. You've got to build inequality into every single thing you do. Uh, it can't be the afterthought anymore. It can't be the thing at the bottom of a great big list of recommendations. It's not the thing you think, well, we'll do a kind of awareness campaign for the whole population and then we'll do something special for, for people who get left behind. It doesn't work. Thank you. So I have another question here from Richard Warren, and Richard asks, can you tell us a little bit more about your suggestion around the NHS, local government and third sector organisations coming together to offer tailored support? Yeah, thanks Richard. Uh, second good question, so you win the prize for, for the most good questions today. Um, uh, again, this is something which, which we've seen some really interesting examples of, uh, and I suspect there'll be lots of learning to be done from this. But, but one of the things that's happened over the last few months is, is um, that, that, that I think is positive, is that that sense of organisations coming together in a geographical area to solve a problem, yeah. because it's been needed to be done now. And often things that seemed impossible, you know, the endless wrangling, the disagreements, the inability to sit around a table together. Um, clearly nobody's sitting around the table together now, but through this wonderful medium, people have found solutions, they've found a way. 
Uh, and I think one of the things that, that, that we need to do through that is obviously encourage that sense of, of collective approach, mm -hmm. uh, a collective responsibility for mental health. But we need to make sure within that, that, that the voices of groups of people that don't get heard are, are absolutely there at the table. Uh, if, if you've got, for example, an integrated care system, which is quite a big level of geography, it's about a million people on average. The chances are, if you've got a mental health organisation around there, it's probably the NHS Trust, or you'd certainly hope so. It might be one of the larger voluntary sector organisations, but that potentially misses out the voices of the very people whose experiences of services are the poorest. So how do we make sure that, that, that the voices of, of people who, who uh, often miss out, who don't find mainstream offers helpful, who think statutory services are the last place they would ever go, mm. how are those voices being heard in those places and how are we making sure that resources are going out to those very organisations that are, that are finding ways of meeting people's needs in, in a more uh, relevant and, and uh, appropriate manner? Um, so again, there'll be lots to learn. I know there are some examples of really interesting practice that we've seen and heard about. We've only just heard about them a little bit for now. Um, but I think collecting some of that knowledge um, and, and really understanding what makes a difference, what helps to unlock uh, that, that sense of common purpose and responsibility and, and how do we make sure that those community-based organisations that, that have, have stepped up are not penalized because they've done something that's out of contract because they've used a lot of their resource from their fundraising to meet people's needs how are we making sure that's properly compensated for and how do we make sure they don't go out of business as a result of having having made really important steps now to work with their statutory sex partners sure thank you thank you andy do you want to ask your final poll before i hand over to thea to close that, that sounds like a marvellous idea, partly because you must be bored of this voice now. So, so one more go. Um, and, and, and we want to get your opinion uh, on, on a really crucial question. Zach, if you could put it up on the screen, partly because I can't remember the exact wording because it's been a very uh, exciting morning so far. So having thought about what you know already and perhaps heard this conversation and some of the questions, do you think that, that uh, the current experience we're going through will make mental health inequalities worse, potentially for a very long time? Will we, as some people say, go back to normal? Think about the Spanish flu, things changed a little bit, but within about a couple of years, uh, it was as if it had never happened. Uh, or can we take this opportunity and actually make things better and really kind of take our chance now to, to, to reduce inequalities in mental health? I know any of us could give any of the answers here, but I want to know what your first instinct is, what you believe is the most likely of these to happen. Um, and we'll see what the answer is. And then we'll see whether you're generally a group of optimists, pessimists, or, 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 or right split down the middle. Hopefully it won't all be the same answer this time. We're going to have to get better at doing our polling questions. What is the collective opinion of the great British public? Definitely representative sample. Okay, I'm going to close the poll in 10 seconds. Get your answer in now if you haven't already. No vote, no voice. Just saying. Okay, here we go. Oh, I'm feeling tense. Wow. So not many people think things aren't going to change, but actually a, 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 an interesting number who, who are feeling quite, quite optimistic. Um, so we need to hold on to what it is that that 44% of people um, think might happen and what we can do to, to really make a change. Um, so please do, if you haven't put stuff in the chat already that, that uh, supports one of those opinions or you want to tweet us uh, with, with the hashtag that Zach mentioned at the beginning, uh, hashtag equality and mental health. Do that uh, after this, if you will, uh, or tweet us any time. The Commission for Equality is going on much longer than this, so, so uh, there's still time to, to share your thoughts. But, but uh, thanks for that. That's really interesting. I'm going to ask uh, Thea to finish, uh, finish the session, I think. Yeah, so, um, oh, well, all right, you've already handed over. All right, hand, the, <laughs> hand over to Thea now. Thea might have another couple of questions, um, and Thea will close. Over to Thea, thank you. 
Okay, just in terms of time, uh, we did have a few extra questions. I'm really sorry we haven't had time for them. But as Andy has said, you can tweet us at Centre for NH and we will respond. We'll do our best. Um, so this is not, not the end. Obviously, it's the formal end. Um, I was definitely one of those people who chose the last answer on the poll because I was trying really hard to be an optimist. But it's very difficult in this day and age. And um, I think it is really concerning the things that the briefing has highlighted that um, the risk of the pandemic increasing mental health inequalities is very real if government don't act soon. So um, I guess what we'd really ask and what we'd leave you with is, as Andy said, if you're able to write to your MP and ask them to put mental health inequalities um, at the heart of the kind of COVID recovery plans, we really appreciate that. If you can share this with your network, share our work, um, be having these conversations because I do really believe that, that change for better is possible if we act now. Um, so thank you so much for joining us today. We're really grateful. Um, do follow us on social media and ask us any more questions. Um, we'd love your feedback on whether this event has been helpful. Um, so do kind of drop us an email, get in touch with us on social media or on our website. Um, and yeah, we really hope you found it helpful and we'd uh, love to see you again. If there's anything else that you really want to have a webinar on, uh, again, let us know that. But until then, uh, take care. Great. Thanks, guys. Thanks very much.